Hi, I'm Terrence Bird. At Health First New Jersey, we believe everyone should be informed about the important health care issues that affect them and their families. That's why Health First is proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking, under the principle of stewardship. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. <laughs> I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. One of the reasons we do one-on-one -on -one is to introduce you to people throughout the tri-state region who are doing important work, making a difference. Let me introduce you to Dr. Bob Jones, who is the president and CEO of Children's Aid and Family Services. It was founded in 1890. Nine, 113 years have been around. Correct. You are, you, you've been there 27 years. 27 years. And how many leaders has there been? I'm the fourth in 113 years. Wow. We're relatively stable. <laughs> I'd say so. I want to thank our friend Elaine Adler and also our friend Don Chalice for introducing us to your organization. Help us understand something. What exactly is the organization as we put up your nonprofit organization's website throughout this segment? Talk about it. We're best known for working with wounded children who have been traumatized through abuse. Um, we have two major buckets of mission commitment. One is to those children who don't have families that can help them heal from that trauma. We help them heal so we can either get them adopted or into a long-term family if they can't be adopted. And then the other mission bucket, if you will, is it's just hard to get through life. So we have dependent care services such as an early learning center with 250 children. We staff three senior centers. We have support programs. Uh, we run the Center for Alcohol and Drug Resources in Bergen County. It provides education and uh, um, awareness around substance abuse and um, adolescent experimentation. So it's really the two ends of the commitment, sort of the children's aid and family services. But you also service a significantly large area. I mean, you serve five counties? Yes. Which ones? Uh, we're Everything from Essex, Passaic, Hudson, Bergen, obviously, and a little bit of Morris. Talk to me about this. In these very difficult economic times, I mean, those of us who are nonprofits, I mean, we run a not for profit educational production company. We're out there every day trying to secure underwriters, keep underwriters, find new sources, trying to be more efficient, have people do eight different jobs. You do the same thing? Absolutely. And it's probably harder for us <clears throat> because. The statistics right now are less than 10% of Americans support charities such as ours. Say that again? Less than 10% of Americans support charities such as ours. Why? Um, it just doesn't come on their radar screen. But 10% of Bergen County would be 100,000 donors, so I'm not giving up yet. Um, but also, it, it's, our donors, it's a mitzvah. They haven't been touched by us. We're not a hospital that saved their life. We're not their synagogue or their church. We're not their university, so um, we have to really touch their heart. And what's helpful about even being on with you is to, to get the word out to people that you can heal these children, make a difference in their life. And um, it's, the journey they go through is amazing, but the outcomes can be wonderful. Talk about your background. How do you come to this? Um, my background, I'm a professional social worker. Uh, then I got a PhD in social policy and administration. Uh, my whole career has been in child welfare and mental health, uh, right out of Rutgers. I worked for St. Vincent Services in Brooklyn and did child welfare in Brooklyn. Uh, then spent about 10 years at St. Clair's uh, Mental Health Center up in Denville and have been here for the last 27, and it's what I love. I mean, I'm lucky I get paid to do something that I love. What do you mean you love? What part of it do you love? Making a difference for other people, seeing the outcomes. Um, we had an event recently in Jasmine one of the young people, she's 22, she's going to graduate from college, um, had a horrible experience, but with the support of the staff... Uh, excuse me, a horrible experience growing up, I think you mean? Being abused as a young child. But with the support of the staff and with um, 
We have an educational fund for the kids. We call it a parents fund. She's going to graduate uh, in January, and um, she's just so happy. And it, those are very rewarding moments. Um, if you think about what the kids have been through, it's horrifying. But if you think about what they can have, it's wonderful. You know, I, I was going to say I hate to do this, but I don't. You use the word abuse. Mm -hmm. You say uh, a kid has been through a tough experience. But my sense is that sometimes you have to be more clear and more specific. Mm -hmm. um, not overly dramatic, mm -hmm. but more clear. Okay. Talk about it. Most of our children have been born drug addicted. Um, they have some serious neurological problems often, sometimes worse. So they struggle with that aspect. And many of them have been sexually abused as young children. Um, that kind of abuse was much rarer when I was starting my career. But with the prevalence of cocaine, crack, and hallucinogenics, uh, kids get targeted by predatory males in a way that was unheard of. Um, 20, 30 years ago. What were they facing? I'm sorry? What are they facing when they become victims like that at such a young and vulnerable phase of their life? Well, what are they usually facing? When you've been th through trauma in a serial way and you've lived in a situation that is chaotic, unpredictable, uh, exploitive, you almost shut down emotionally. So many of our kids aren't aware of what's going on for themselves, physically or emotionally, and it'll come out in behaviors. And the behaviors are usually ones that are destructive for them or other people. Our challenge is to get them to recognize, to reconnect, if you will, so that they can make a choice about being angry, make a choice about being sad, as opposed to just have it act out in behavior. Very often, uh, the other piece of this equation for your organization, and again, we're doing this uh, part of the one-on-one -on -one initiative. For those of you who watch us every evening on, on several PBS stations, you know that um, we do a <coughs> mini-series within one-on-one -on -one called Make a Difference. We are trying to make a difference here. That's why Bob is here. But you can log on to that website. You can make a contribution. You can try to make a difference. But one of the areas that you're making a difference on in is in foster care. Right. Talk about that. The treatment foster home program that we have um, takes kids who have been severely traumatized, but they have the ability to tolerate the intimacy of a family. We have a phenomenal track record of the kids actually being adopted by their treatment home parents. And that's a big problem for us because then we lose the home. Right. So one of our needs are people who would step forward and learn about the kids. I don't ask people, would you like to be a foster parent? That's like asking on your face, first date how many children do you want to have and where do right. you want to retire. But if they're remotely interested in these kids, uh, volunteer, get involved, become a mentor, become a tutor. Um, and most of the people who ultimately adopt our children never in a million years woke up one morning and said, gee, I'd like to adopt an emotionally struggling youngster, teenager. Uh, we're not talking about babies. We're talking about children 10, 11 years old and up and sometimes teenagers. What difference, what impact can a solid, loving foster family have on some of these uh, children and kids who aren't children, but a little older? In a word, huge. Um, the difference between being in a treatment foster home or say a residential setting or Why group Why are you calling home, it a treatment foster home? Because these are kids who have serious emotional problems. We've got psychiatrists involved with all of them. We have social workers involved with them. It's, it's different than a regular foster home, which um, the state of New Jersey uh, would typically run. As a treatment agency, we don't really receive a referral until a child's failed in five to six state homes. Right. Um, so these kids have trouble with intimacy. They have trouble um, believing in themselves. They blame themselves often for all those. So the stability of a treatment home of a foster family is huge for them. Uh, and they work hard at getting rejected, and they throw you many challenges. Um, that commitment, that bond, that claiming process is very healing for them. Also, as they age out into their 20s, there are people who care about them. Uh, many of our kids stay in touch with their foster families. Dr. Bob Jones, President and CEO of Children's Aid and Family Services. After 27 years, it is clear you've lost none of the passion. Not at all. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Stay tuned one on one. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, 
email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. The following a for Education segment has been brought to you by the New Jersey Education Association. There he is, Peter Horn, Project 79 coordinator, Westfield High School. Good to see you, Peter. Great to be here, Steve. This is part of our classroom close-up series we're doing in cooperation with our partners at the New Jersey Education Association, uh, featuring teachers who are making a huge difference. Uh, Got to ask you, Project 79 is, we're about to see a video from the classroom close-up series in just a second. What is Project 79? Well, it's named for the year that it was founded. Um, that's what the 79 stands for. And we've been around uh, for as long as we have because we take care of a population of students within Westfield High School uh, who are of a average to above average academic ability, but they just haven't connected with school, haven't thrived in school as they would like to before they come into Project 79. One of the great things about this series is that our partners at the NJEA actually produced these terrific three-minute videos that um, really set a context for our discussion afterwards and it paints a picture that's a lot better than I could describe. We'll see the video and then we'll talk more with Peter. Let's take a look at Classroom Close-Up. All right, guys, that's homeroom. Come on, bring it inside. Let's, let's do it. An alternative education program in Westfield is helping high school students discover themselves as learners by combining rigorous academics with individualized instruction. Project 79 is an alternate form of learning where they bring up the question like, is there a way that we can get kids who aren't doing well in mainstream, and instead of just giving up on them, putting them in an environment where they can succeed and do better. Project 79 exists because there was a superintendent of schools way back in 1978 who, who just had on his radar, way on the side of his radar, the idea that there was a group of kids that we were in danger of losing. His name was Larry Green. And so he had this idea that maybe with the right group of teachers, he might be able to offer something to kids that would make school feel more meaningful and make them want to be here. Project 79 is a college preparatory curriculum, so project students take the same subjects at the same levels as students not in the program. The difference is the teaching. One of our purposes is to try to you know, have each kid figure out how to use the unique equipment that's between his or her ears. You know, I mean, everybody looks at things differently, everybody's got a different mind, so to get a sense of your learning style, we are a little bit more hands-on, and we can be a little bit more individually responsive because of the size of the classes, but also because of the nature of the activities and projects that we take on. It's the way school should be done. I thought it was really cool because the classes are really small and the teachers concentrate on you better than they did in mainstream, and you're more like involved and you play more engaging games that get you interested in what you're learning. I just moved to Westfield as a freshman. It was very difficult for me to fit in. I was struggling with most of my classes, not because I couldn't understand it, but just because I felt different and I didn't want to be there. So I came into Project and immediately I started paying more attention. I had friends to talk to and my grades have gone from very low to straight A's right now. The highly collaborative approach Project 79's small team of teachers is able to take with the approximately 120 students who choose to participate in the program has led to more than three decades of success and the program becoming a model for alternative education throughout the region. I think that if Project was never presented with me, there's no way I would be going to the school I am today or I would have nearly the, as many friends that I have now and it really, it completely changed my life. One of the ways that I think about the students in this program, um, and it's not an image that I, you know, came up with, but I, I think of them as orchids, that, you know, this is the most stunning uh, and varied um, flower on earth, but it needs the right conditions, you know, in order to amaze you. If you provide the right conditions for our kids, they will continue to amaze us. What a great program. Thank you. How proud are you? It's powerful to see that. I'm, I'm very much, um, I'm addressed. I'm addressed. It's something, you know, I work in the program every day. This is my 11th year um, that I'll be working in Project 79. Describe your role there. Uh, I am the uh, English teacher for juniors and seniors, but I'm also the coordinator of the program, which I see as uh, the very fortunate role of kind of brokering 
the vision um, with, that we work together as a team of teachers and also getting lots of impact uh, uh, feedback from students and parents as well about the kinds of things we need to be doing the directions we need to be going in. But I the other teachers, mm -hmm. are we talking certain kinds of teachers? Sure. Who are they? I mean, are they Sure. Well, they're, they're, they're people who, are, who come from the different disciplines and they're great teachers in terms of content area, but really what we look for, um, because we have a, a, a program that delivers the major subject areas, but also we have a teaching artist in residence, um, for example, to connect along uh, some of the other modes of expression. People who are not just good uh, as a chemistry teacher, for example, being all over it there, but also um, consistently demonstrate that willingness and uh, eagerness to get to know the whole student and to see that. What does that mean? Eagerness it, to get to know it the means whole to, student. To recognize that you are not just the person in front of me for 42 minutes that I'm assigning English work to or having the conversations with, that you have this whole life uh, and interests, which may not include English actually, outside yeah. the classroom. But I have to, you know, to try to understand that a little bit. Um, and to recognize that the part of what I want to do is to figure out a way to present some of the magic and come a little bit closer to you, you for know, the discipline. Uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting, Peter. You right. to me. Uh, you went to Princeton University. Yes, sir. You come back to teach, right? Yeah. Do you ever get some of your friends, I'm not saying from Princeton, I hate when someone says your Ivy League friends, right? Sure. I'm a Rutgers guy, so we can't say that. It's all right. Even though we like to believe we're part of the Ivy League in our own minds, right? Whatever that means. Um, do you ever get any of your friends who really don't understand the teaching profession and the impact that you really, really have on these young people and the ability that you have to change their minds, asking, what are you doing? Do you ever get sure, that? Sure, sure. We understand the question. I actually, I, I don't get it as often as, as, as people might think. And, and I think part of the reason is that um, the people I have those conversations with most often, you know, if when, when we're honest about it, whoever we are, we can always recognize that there are teachers who have made tremendous difference, you know, in, in our lives. Um, and whether you're going to grow up to be a governor uh, or a head of a corporation or a shop owner, um, you recognize that it was somebody, probably, uh, who took you seriously and saw you as a whole person who helped you along the path to wherever it is that you're going. Um, and of course, it's very important when we're looking at the future as we are now, where the kinds of jobs that people will be doing haven't even been made yet. You know, so the people who are going to cultivate those minds, uh, people who are going to take them seriously, are more as as important as ever. Listen, there are whole kinds of all kinds of questions I could ask you more about the curriculum and the sure. details of the program, but I'm not going to. I'm more interested in in you and your attitude about being a teacher. Question. Mm -hmm. Final question before I let you out of here. How much passion do you feel today after teaching for how many years again? This is going to be my 16th year. How much passion do you feel today compared to the day you started? It's, it's tremendous. It's, it's, it's work that's different every day, um, and I believe that. So it's, that's absolutely undiminished. At this point right now, I'm really embracing this role that I have to be able to lead, to be a teacher leader as well as teacher, and that's part of what keeps it interesting. Um, but I believe that every teacher you know, has that capacity, and that's part of why I'm so fortunate to be able to work in the program with the colleagues that I have, um, because they recognize that each of us has tremendous capacity to make a difference. We're very fortunate to have you. Thanks, Steve. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Peter Horn, it. as uh, Project 79 coordinator, Westfield High School, part of our Classroom Close-Up series, uh, done in cooperation with our friends at the NJEA. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. Great job. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash steveadubato, Ph.D. Scott Redeen is Executive Director, Project Literacy of Greater Bergen County. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank uh, you. While we put up your website, uh, Scott, throughout the segment, talk to us about your organization and what your mission is. Well, we are one of the largest nonprofits in uh, North Jersey that deals with the issue of literacy. There are many, many uh, agencies that deal with literacy, but we're the clearinghouse for many of these organizations. What does that mean, a clearinghouse? 
Well, a lot of people come to us for information about literacy. They call us up through the email, they see our website, and they come to us and they say, we need help. We need to have friends that need help. So where do we go? And uh, they can come to us, or they can come to a lot of places that have uh, these type of ESL and basic literacy programs in libraries throughout all of Bergen County. What would you say to those watching uh, throughout the tri-state area and, and beyond, who say, wait a minute, hold on. Literacy? We still have a problem with literacy, you say? The answer is the, definitely yes. We definitely have a problem with literacy, both in the United States, in the state of New Jersey, and Bergen County, which is one of the wealthiest counties in all of the United States. However, uh, there are quite a few people that fall through the cracks, that have actually even graduated from high school, that still have low literacy levels. We also have a quite a large immigrant uh, population that comes to the United States. And where do they go? They come to New Jersey, northern New Jersey and they need help. Now, that's split into two. There are people that are, come, that are fluent in their own language, but uh, they're PhDs, doctorates, uh, et cetera. But when they uh, come here, they need help. And then there are people, of course, that are illiterate in their own country. We've had people that literally uh, not allowed to go to school. they are women who are Well, because of the culture of that the country? Cult exactly, yeah. And exactly. so they come here and then? They come to the United States looking for a better uh, life and uh, trying to improve themselves, and the only way to make it in the United States, of course, is to be, to be literate. You know, it's interesting, Scott, you, you, you talked to some of our producers in preparation for the program in the pre-interview, and you started talking about the connection between literacy, or problems connected to uh, literacy, and, and social problems, particularly health. Let's break that down. What is the correlation, the connection? Well, there's, there's a very uh, strong correlation between the two. There's a lot of problems in society that comes from not being literate. Give for us a for instance. For example, reading prescription bottles. Now, I must start by saying, talking about the embarrassment factor. A lot of people who are illiterate don't want to talk about it, don't want people to know about it. We call it the big hidden problem. So that's a, that's a problem in itself. So if they don't have anybody who can read these prescription bottles, they guess. And sometimes they find themselves in the emergency room. Guess at? Guess at what they're supposed to take, how many oh. pills they're supposed to take, whether they're supposed to take it with water, eat food, things like that. So it, it's crazy, but uh, a lot of the problems with such things like that. Then we have seniors who don't do that. They actually have a 50% greater chance of dying if they are not literate because of factors like this. And the number one factor, which is shocking to me, the number one factor, determining factor of a child's health is the mother's literacy. Hold on, back up. Five-year-old kid his mom, her mom, not literate, the direct connection to that mom's inability to read and that child's health is, give us the example there. Again, uh, doctors, prescription notes, prescription bottles, literacy information, things, pamphlets, things that you take for granted that you read every day. Uh, again, reading all kinds of things. They're not reading them, they don't understand them. And how do they make decisions about what it, the, the dosage is, or all kinds of things. Because yeah. they, do, they do something. They give some dose, don't right. they? Yes, but the, again, many times you'll find them guessing. <sighs> They're not sure what to do, but again, okay. with the embarrassment fact that they don't want to talk to other people and ask people. The connection between literacy problems and unemployment. Well, that's the same thing. Very, very strong factor, which people don't know. First of all, uh, most of the people that are in jails are, are illiterate because they don't have the skills to find a job and they become desperate and so they turn to a life of crime. People who cannot read or write cannot fill out job applications. They don't understand what, the, what they're doing in terms of finding a correct job and they certainly won't be hired if they don't have a high school degree. Okay, here's the, here's the catch-22 that I'm saying. We're doing this program right now. We're talking about the work that your organization does. You have to be able to read the website in order to access the website to get more information. Right? And by the way, say you don't live in this area, but you want to connect to another organization involved in literacy, which your organization could be the clearinghouse, as you said. Yes. You live in Brooklyn, you can help. You live in the Bronx, Absolutely. you live in South Jersey, wherever it is. But you can't read. You're watching TV, but you can't read. But you want help in the area of literacy? Well, you'd be surprised how word of mouth and, and, and some people who are not literate can actually navigate websites and, and use computers with help of other people. 
so they can they can get through. Wow. That's the thing that we talk about. We call it bluffing it, where people bluffing it. They survive. They get through. They get through the day, but their lives are very very difficult. And instead of getting the help, the, the embarrassment factor is so big that they would rather try to do things on their own with the help of their wives or spouses or things like that, that they don't get the help that they need. And finally, before I let you out of here, how important are volunteers to your operation? And by the way, if someone logs onto your site, could they potentially volunteer in addition to providing a financial contribution? Volunteers. We are always looking for volunteers. The thing that I must stress is that this type of volunteerism is a little bit separate than many other organizations. There is a commitment. You are working with a student on a one-to-one -one basis. Therefore, you need to meet with them at least once a week for an hour and a half to two hours a week because you need somebody who's steady, who works with them, who feels comfortable with them. So you have to uh, make a commitment to that. You can't just pop in and pop out. Commitment. Correct. Well, we have a five-week training program to start to make sure that you help them do it. And then you help them, of course. We're always there. We're with them all st every step of the way. Scott, you're doing important work. Keep Thank it you. up because Thank the you. problem is bigger than anyone thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking, under the principle of stewardship. PSE&G committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan is growing in the Garden State. Thousands of members in Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Passaic, and Union Counties depend on Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. And in January 2012, Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan will be available in Somerset and Middlesex counties as well. If you're eligible for Medicare and live in New Jersey, find out more about Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Feel good about your health care coverage. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. And I'm Steve Adubato. Join us every week on New Jersey Capital Report. Because we'll ask the questions that you want and need answered.